An anti-Biden Trump appointed federal judge in Louisiana strikes again and has issued an overbroad and vague injunction stopping dozens of federal agencies and staffers from making any contact with social media companies in an effort to take misinformation and hate speech down, which apparently Republican attorney generals urge are the things that need protecting under the First Amendment. Has the judge properly balanced competing public interests in preventing social media from promoting hate speech and terrorist coordination against legitimate First Amendment protected speech? Or is the new injunction on a fast track to being overturned as unconstitutional and an encroachment on the executive branch's powers? Hail to the chief ringtones at all, Pence at Trump's behest called his old buddy, then Arizona Governor Ducey, to influence the Electoral College certification for Arizona and its 11 votes for Biden, where he won by more than 10,000 votes. Was he just checking in during a normal process, as Pence now claims, or was he pressuring governors and secretary of states like Trump is caught doing on recordings to overturn the will of the people? Just how far up his neck is Pence's involvement in the coup? I mean, he's positioning himself as a hero of Jan 6, but is he? And speaking of sniveling cowards, George Santos and his counsel received 80,000 pages of documents in a care package from the Department of Justice um, and asked if they could review it during their summer vacation. And it's update time in the Mar-a-Lago criminal case against Walt Nauta and Trump as they share a private stake date, stake, <laughs> private cheese steak date. Sorry, everybody. And now Nauta struggles to find his Southern District of Florida counsel for tomorrow's twice postponed arraignment. And the federal magistrate signals he is going to unseal more of the redacted search warrant affidavits from last August so the public can see more of the basis for the search warrants. All that and so much more on the midweek edition of Legal AF with your regular co-anchors, Michael Popak and Karen Friedman Agnifilo, only on the Midas Touch Network. It's going to be a sizzling indictment summer, Karen, and I wouldn't want it any other way. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I woke up this morning feeling like an indictment's coming soon. I don't know. It just feels like this week, next week, something's going to be happening, whether it's a superseding indictment in Mar-a-Lago, which you guys have been talking about, or other charges related to classified documents, perhaps in New Jersey, or whether it's January 6th. You know, I, I just, I sense that we're, we're at that point where it's going to be very soon. Last week, uh, with, or on Saturday with Ben, I said, I said I was, I was tingling waiting for I, I, these I things know. to happen. I and know. then Ben spent the entire rest of the podcast teasing me about my tingling. But it's good to hear that my fellow co-anchor and colleague also has her spider senses and believes what we all believe, which is this is going to be a summer of multiply indicted Donald Trump, not just one. I mean, he's dying the death of a thousand paper cuts where he's bleeding out on live television the way the indictments are coming. He has an excuse for all of them. None of them are consistent with anything he's ever said in the past or he will say in the future. And that's the problem with his defense because he's shape-shifting at rallies and when he's grabbing a cheesesteak with Walt Nauta and when he's got a favorable audience of, you know, hand-picked, paid uh, people for adulation purposes. But in a courtroom, as you and I both know, as does Ben, that doesn't fly. In fact, quite the opposite. And you'll get hanged by your own words. You know there's a whole team. I'm sure you had one when you were the number two at the Manhattan DA's office, Karen. There's just a whole team that's just scouring social media for his comments and stringing them together and, com and with a comparison chart, right? A timeline, this is what I would do. I'm sure they're doing it. A timeline comparison chart of his comments over time and his trial balloons, you know, Donald Trump's trial balloons, like the one I love about when he got caught on the recording at Bedminster, obviously unfurling a map and Iranian war documents to show his assembled group of, of bootlickers who are all laughing with him. Ha ha ha, national security, national defense information. Isn't that grand? Uh, that's not, no, we don't have security clearances. Who Bring us a Coke. Who cares? You can hear what he's doing. You hear the rough, the, and now he said, no, no, the plans, that was building plans. That was piles of magazine articles that I have in my, I wasn't showing NDI. I would, I would never admit to that, but he's, 
But that, but that's that is the framework that we're going to cover when we get to our segment about the updates on Mar-a-Lago. But there's been some breaking news that I think you and I should turn to first at the top of the hour, and that is a self-selected, you know, forum shopping set of Republican attorney generals for, um, you know, a couple of red meat states found their judge of choice. They've got two of them. They got the guy that sits in Abilene, Texas, um, whenever they want to go after uh, abortion or abortion pills or abortion drugs or anything like that. And they got Judge Dougherty, another Trump appointee, Terry Dougherty, in a little tiny parish in Louisiana you've probably never been to or heard of, but who has just issued an injunction, a permanent injunction subject to trial against dozens of federal agencies, of course, all executive branch, all run by Joe Biden and the people under him, you know, everything from the Health and Human Services to the National Infectious Disease to the CDC to the FBI to the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency and everybody at the, in the White House that's involved with social media because the judge has found that if the allegations of the plaintiffs are true, that's a pretty big if, if they're true, it's the most massive uh, First Amendment violation uh, attempt to squash free speech in the history of America. Those are pretty drastic words for a guy whose own um, appellate court, the Fifth Circuit, uh, thought he had gone too far when he was ordering Jen Saki Saki bomb to sit for a deposition because it, because the it hadn't been made out. But you know he's this is he's going all out here. Seven page injunction, and it lists Karen a whole bunch of things that are so vague and overbroad, I don't know how they could be possibly upheld, even by a Supreme Court who is hot for the First Amendment. And I mean this, the uh, the MAGA right wing of the court based on a recent ruling last week. They love, they love themselves the First Amendment, uh, but I think this is a, this has gone too far because the the all of the federal agencies, the entire Biden administration, the executive branch effectively, is enjoined, meaning they cannot, they are prevented and precluded from contacting social media companies, that's all of them, from Twitter to Facebook to YouTube, TikTok and all the rest of them, to, for the purposes of, listen to these words, Karen, urge, encourage, pressure, or induce any type of speech that is on the platform, harmful, hateful, or not with a very limited set of carve outs. And they're enjoined by name. I mean, they, they're listing everybody from Mayorkas to whoever the current CDC director is to Joe, Bi I mean, to Joe Biden, I mean, the whole thing. And they, he, he did one carve out, this Judge Dougherty. He said that um, they are allowed to go after crimes, to have criminal activity taken down, to have national security issues that are being compromised, taken down. But if it's a, in his view, and he doesn't define this, a protected First Amendment expression, not only is hands off, it's injunction on, don't pick up the phone, don't have the meeting, you'll be violating my injunction. And, um, you know, the quote that we'll try to find uh, that he says at the end that if, what, if, if it is true, if it is true in the in the papers filed by the um, filed by the Republican governors, uh, if it is true and he's found it is more likely than not the likelihood of success on the merits, which is one of the factors for an injunction, is in favor of them. If that's all true, it is the the greatest suppression of First Amendment rights ever in the history of our government. Uh, I don't think that's true. And I think he's not balanced properly those competing interests, nor the First Amendment right of the government to have a dialogue with social media about um, not First Amendment expression. Look, I, I, I may not like what, you know, JFK, uh, I mean, RFK Jr. has to say, but I'll support his right to say it all day long, as long as it doesn't verge into unprotected speech that's not protected by the First Amendment. Go drink Clorox because that will solve your COVID problem. That's not really protected. 
Um, but his opinions about vaccine and the link to um, autism or don't, you know, all the, he's, you know, he's not a doctor, but he has the right to express his opinion. And I'll, and I will, like the ACLU, I will protect the right of, you know, Nazis to march down the street of a Jewish neighborhood, not because I like it, but because I think that's, that's where the First Amendment is. But to ban Karen, the government, from having a say in the public marketplace, in the town square, at the soapbox at all, and abdicate that responsibility and just give it over to the right wing crazies to run amok on, on the internet, because that's where this goes. Talk to me about wh what your reaction was to it, and then where do you think it goes with the Fifth Circuit and this particular US Supreme Court? Yeah, so for me, this was, you know, I, I'm still getting used to the fact that you can so blatantly forum shop like this. And that's what the, you know, MAGA Republicans do, you know, if just just for people who are wondering how that happens and how people how people can do that. Let's remember how federal judges are assigned to a case. So how did Donald Trump get Eileen Cannon in Florida? Well, there's, you know, more than a dozen federal judges in that in that jurisdiction and they literally spin a wheel and at random is when you get assigned a judge. And he got lucky there. He got somebody who he appointed and who clearly sympathizes with him. Well, there are certain jurisdictions and it depends on the size of the jurisdiction will depend on the number of judges. So, you know, bigger cities like New York City has two in two different districts, right? We have the Southern District of New York, Eastern District of New York, and each one has dozens of, of judges who you could get when randomly assigned when, when there's a case. But there are some jurisdictions, some areas that are so minuscule and small in this country that there's only one federal judge who sits in that jurisdiction, who hears cases uh, that come up in that area. And Trump, when he was president, there were two open seats in jurisdictions such as that. As you said, the the judge who, who in Texas who ruled on Mifeprestone, the abortion pill, was one of those judges. And here is another one, another jurisdiction where there is one judge. So he was guaranteed to get a judge that he appointed in 2017 and who is clearly sympathetic to his causes and will do his bidding for him. And so he got two uh, Republican governors to bring a suit in this one jurisdiction, knowing they will get this judge and knowing they'll get this result. It's just this absolutely um, shocking to anyone who hears this. I'm sure people who are listening to this and hear this just are shaking their head saying, how is that fair? How is that possible? But, you know, we have to remind people just of how that works and how how this is done and why this is done and how this is done in such bad faith. This is absolutely result driven. You are looking for your results. So you're looking for a judge who's going to give your result. And lo and behold, that's what happened here. You know, this, this suit related to mostly, um, COVID, right? So this was, um, this was, uh, uh, under the guise of that the government was too involved in um, in working with the social media com companies to limit the false information that got out there on things like vaccines and mandates and and you know and and covid right because there was so much misinformation going on during that time and so and and that that was the basis of the suit saying you overstepped you should you know people should be able to say whatever they want even if it's you know things like um you know what you were saying about you know whatever just the it, things about the um illegitimate uh, the illegitimacy regarding um, vaccines, et cetera. So this, you know, it was surprising to me, you know, ha practically half of this injunction uh, was listing out the, not only the agencies that can't have contact, right? It's also the individuals in the agencies. I mean, they named names too. I've never seen it like that, something like that. It's like, you know, every single person, you know, it's like, it bars the entire Department of Health and Human Services, including, you know, Michael Popak, who, you know, whatever, like they listed out many, many people in there. So this was a sweeping injunction that didn't just list out the agencies, but also listed the individuals and barred them from meeting with the social media companies for the purposes of urging removal of free speech content. That's what he said. He says, you know, 
this is all free speech and you can't talk to them about removing it. You can't flag content for them. You can't urge in any matter, in any manner that it gets deleted. You can't email, call, text, or have any communication whatsoever for the purpose of this. Um, you can't even collaborate with certain groups for the purpose of removing them. Because in my mind, I would, as I was reading this, I thought, oh, well, the government can just work with certain groups, uh, third party groups, you know, like um, not for profits, et cetera, advocacy groups, and then they can work with the social media companies. Nope, that can't be done either. Either. You can't act in concert with others who are who are doing this. I mean, it, it was so specific. Um, I think that this has significant First Amendment implications. I don't know how this is going to be upheld, but of course the Republicans say this is a victory, saying you know social media sites disproportionately take down right leaning content, and this is in you know like collaboration or cahoots with the government. Um, and so you know this judge Terry. Is it Doughty, Dowdy? There's no R in there, but whatever, however, it's D O U G H T Y. Um, you know, he issued this in judgment, uh, this injunction, I should say. Um, and as you said, you know, that this, the government cannot talk to social media companies for the purpose of, you know, doing anything regarding free speech. He does say, that, however, that law enforcement, who, by the way, law enforcement works with social media companies all the time, right? We, you know, I was involved in these efforts. We would, we would flag child porn. We would flag human trafficking, you know, drug dealing on the, on the, the World Wide web, you know, the black market, gun sales, you know, um, hate speech, terrorism, all kinds of stuff. You know, we, it's, of course the government works with social media. I mean, that's absolutely what they do. So he then says, Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, carve that out, you know, it's okay to notify them about crimes, national security threats, voting suppression, any foreign attempts to influence the elections. Um, but, you know, he's talks, but, but his ban is so subjective and so vague, right? He says you can't have any, government can't have any contact with the social media um, companies related to protected free speech. Well, you know what, it, it, I feel like it's incredibly um, vague, unconstitutionally so. Um, and so I don't necessarily, uh, see this as, um, as being upheld by the Fifth Circuit. I do worry about the Supreme Court though, you know, where it's going to go inevitably because, you know, as we have seen, they're pretty lawless at this point. So, so it's hard to know, uh, what, what the true ramifications of this will be, but I do think it is, it is incredibly, um, incredibly subjective and vague. It doesn't give any guidance to law enforcement at all. And I think people, or not just law enforcement, government agencies, the White House, everybody. So I think people are going to be scratching their heads thinking, you know, what, what are we going to be, you know, how, how do we do this? Right. And I, I just think that this is, is this going to be overturned? But I don't know. Who knows? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's exactly the what's going to happen. I, I, I think it's 50-50 at the fifth. Depends on the panel, the three-judge panel that they pull. I don't think they'll pull the exact same panel they got before, which who actually um, uh, brushed him back, this judge, thought he had gone too far in ordering people like the people you listed sitting for depositions. But we'll have to see what the, you know, if he gets, uh, you know, we always joke about it being like uh, the one R bandit in in, uh, in a casino. You know, if they get cherry, 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 Trump, 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 or something like that, we'll have to see what the reaction is there. But then at the Supreme Court level, who the heck knows? They were all over the map this term on First Amendment. You know, five days before they came out with 303 creative BS website designer thing, fake website designer uh, case in order for them to declare the First Amendment trumps public accommodations. And you're allowed to both accept money from the public and also use your First Amendment to say, I don't want to serve LGBTQ plus blacks, Jews or whatever, because it's against my it's against because I have a, a, a good faith belief that I shouldn't have to do that and be forced to use my speech my First Amendment expression, in, in, uh, you know, on behalf of them. So that's 303 Creative. Five days earlier, they really limited the First Amendment or uh, about um, the use of it in stalking cases. So they're a little bit over the map. I don't know what this six to three 
you know, Gorsuch again on First Amendment probably would rule about whether this judge's particular injunction based on the record that was before him, because let's just do a little tutorial on that. The injunction is an equitable proceeding that happens before the case goes to trial at a preliminary phase. Sometimes we call it a temporary restraining order, a temporary injunction, or a preliminary injunction or permanent injunction until trial. They're all basically the same thing. The factor is that you have to approve for each changes a bit and the burden of proof changes a bit. But here he said, oh no, on the record already established, the emails that I've seen of the Republican uh, attorney generals have supplied to me. You know, I think this is the, the greatest suppression by the government of First Amendment rights in the history of the world. And, uh, and then he issues the seven page order. But I don't think, I think there's a mismatch between what I've seen in the evidence, in the briefing and in the eventual order there's a, actually a memorandum of law that supports this order that I've reviewed. Um, I think he's wrong, and I think his order is both overbroad. If he wants to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish, he should have done it on a narrower set of injunctions, narrower group of people. And, and this whole thing about urging, you know, uh, uh, pressuring, inducing, you know, and then the few ca carve outs is also vague. Because he, he, he triggers, this judge triggers a lot of his order, drives a lot of his order by saying, well, if it's protected First Amendment speech, but if it's not a protected First Amendment speech, then you're okay. But I mean, how do you, how do you run a government? You know, to paraphrase Casey Stengel, that's no way to run a baseball team. How are you supposed to run a government that? Well, what is protected? What isn't protected? You're leaving that to me to decide before I run afoul of your injunction? So I think the injunction, the way it's written, which I don't know who did this, the judge, his clerks, if this is just a draft from the attorney generals that he just happily signed. But um, we're going to have to see. It's going to go up to the Supremes at some point, depending upon what the fifth does. You know, the Republicans are all touting it as, you know, it's a great day in America on 4th of July, you know, that we can yeah, have missing. What, what did you think about that, actually? Because I was like, I had to, I did a double take because courts are closed on the 4th of July. So mm, not this one. Yeah, well, no, I thought they were sending a message, right? He saved this for the 4th of July, don't of you think? Of course, of course, because I've gotten orders from federal judges on weird. Like on Sunday night, I'll get an order because they're open and they call their clerks and hey, post it on the docket. Yeah, no, that was an F you to the Biden administration. Exactly. It's the second time. We, we didn't talk about this judge at the top, but this judge is also the one that eliminated and, and issued it in, uh, I almost said worldwide, a, a, a United States-wide, country-wide injunction against uh, COVID vaccine being forced on early start uh, preschool education programs and that type of thing by the Biden, by the Biden administration. So he's he has, this judge has uh, reveled in taking on Joe Biden. And healthcare and, workers. And healthcare workers, and, uh, right, exactly. So, and, and it starts even, you had a good overview at the top of the of the top of the segment about well how do we get to this judge and how did they self select this judge in effect because they had a one in one chance because he's the only judge that sits in this parish in Louisiana he's the only federal judge and it starts even before that when Trump is looking at the map of potential appointments when he comes in guided and when I mean guided I mean the firm hand of the Federalist Society directly up his you know what manipulating his mouth about what to do with with the i'm doing a good puppet impression here uh for those that watch us on youtube uh, manipulating trump's mouth about pick this judge and put this judge here it starts even before that they know about the abilene texas one we you know one judge divisions and they are very careful to make sure they get the right super right wing maga person there because that's the place, that's going to be the soft underbelly of our justice system that they're going to exploit at the right moment. It starts before with a, with a Federalist Society war map about where are the one and where are the two judge uh, venues and where are the three judge venues. And let's try to get, in, get our people in there first, because those are the ones we're going to go to for nationwide injunctions. And we're seeing, you know, the fruit of those, those really terrible um, uh, that terrible conduct by the Federalist Society led by Trump, uh, seeing it here in cases just like this one. Um, 
Karen, anything else on this particular segment before we talk a little bit about the next one? No. Okay. Right, right. We've taken care of taking care of that one. Well, we're gonna we're gonna talk next about um, yours, I, mine. It and- just bugs me. It just upsets me when you <laughs> you talk about it like that. I get so agitated. Uh, I just can't believe yeah. that our country works that way. That you can have these single judge in a single place. You know, places that can have nationwide impact. Like it just. Right. Every time you have to ask yourself, you know, how is that possible? How can they do a nationwide injunction on yeah. something, right? Yeah. But it's because it's because they enjoin, you know, the president, right? right. The White the government, House. The government. The government. The executive right. power. And, and they have another problem we didn't really talk about. Separation the, of powers? They have a separation of powers problem, I was going to ask you about that, yeah. Yeah, because this is the executive branch, which within its sphere is, is a co-equal branch of government that's not supposed to be challenged about what it does, whether it be through social media, reg- why don't we just regulate what our what the White House press office does? Well, oh, White House press office, you can't hold press conferences either. You can't you can't place articles. You can't co- collaborate because he even said collaborate with um, with anything. You can't because because yeah. it be, but that is, they have their own First Amendment rights That's and they have their own. Ex- I was just right. going to say, if you're all about the First Amendment, what about their First Amendment right? So what about the gonna... White House press secretary's First Amendment right to talk to social media companies, right? Like maybe the injunction has to be on social media companies. Like maybe he can, not that he should, but maybe that is, but how does he get to say, you know, no, work. right, exactly. It's <laughs> the just, problem it's, is he doesn't, yeah. you know? And and so the separation of powers is just for those that follow us from around the world or haven't really thought about separation of powers in a long, long time. You know, you've got the three branches of government. They are co-equal and within their own sphere, they are they reign supreme. And when one branch, the judiciary, tries to use the Constitution to argue that they've exceeded their powers, how could you exceed your powers talking to social media to get your message to get your message out yeah. uh, and gagging them while all the crazies go meet on social media and use it for, you know, terrorism and criminal things and hate crimes and everything else and misinformation and transgender attacks and that kind of thing. Well, we're going to we're going to continue to follow this on on us only. I think we do and we can on Legal AF. And, and, comment- and then the other question is, as you were saying before, as we were as we were saying is if, like, say, uh, somebody said in the Biden administration says, oh, I don't think that is protected speech, right? I don't think that's First Amendment free speech. So I'm going to talk to the social media company. And then somebody else is going to come along and say, no, you were wrong. Who's going to be the umpire for that? This, you know, it just makes no sense. The way that this is written, I, I think it's unconstitutionally vague. I think there's a First Amendment issue that we're trying to, re- he's trying to restrict the First Amendment rights of all of the individuals who he has now enjoined. And I think it's also just way too subjective. So I, I just don't think that this, I don't think this can stand the way it's written. So we'll follow that closely. And um, coming up next on Legal AF, we're going to cover George Santos's appearance in court, the government telling him that he's got 80,000 pages of evidence to go through, and George and his lawyer asking for the summer recess to go through all those documents. We'll, we'll do all of that next. But first, a word from one of Midas Touch Network sponsors. Did you know that the best tasting honey on the planet comes from New Zealand? It's called Manuka honey. Manukura has absolutely mastered the art of beekeeping. Their super honey is always 100% raw and has a rich and creamy texture that's unlike anything you've ever tried before. It's a super honey because of its unique antioxidants and prebiotics, as well as a natural antibacterial compound called MGO that only comes from the nectar of this tea tree. I tried the 850 MGO rated Manakura honey from the bottle, and wow, it was better than I could have ever imagined. Not to mention that it contains nutrients that support optimal immune and digestive health. Every batch is 100% traceable with a unique QR code on every jar. You can verify potency and purity. You can even learn about the beekeeper that harvested your honey. I had my honey straight from the spoon and it was delicious by itself. But you can also add it to tea or coffee, pancakes, yogurt, salad dressing, ice cream, whatever you like. The creamy caramel texture melts in your mouth and it's unlike anything I've ever tried. Manakura. It's savory, it's delicious, and truly the best honey I've ever had in my life. 
Manakurasani is available in a range of easy-to-use formats, including squeeze bottles and compostable honey sticks, so you can eat it straight or add to your favorite foods and drinks. If you head to manakura.com slash legalaf or use code legalaf, you'll automatically get a free pack of honey sticks with your order, a $15 value. That's M-A-N-U-K-O-R-A dot com slash legalaf or use code legalaf to get a free pack of compostable honey sticks with your order. You haven't tasted or seen honey like this before, so indulge and try some honey with superpowers with Manakura. Hey, we're back. <laughs> you look so thrilled. I know. <laughs> you know, I'm having a little technical difficulties today with my equipment, but I think I think we've solved it. Let's uh, jump into Santos, former prosecutor, show up in court, brings his lawyer. And just to remind everybody, because it's, it's been a while, May the 10th or so of this year, Representative George Santos was indicted in 13 counts in the Eastern District of New York, which sits over at places like Long Island at the Central Islip, New York, on Long Island, uh, Eastern District of New York, Federal Courthouse. Karen, you've been to the Central Islip Federal Courthouse? I have. It's it's far. <laughs> it yeah, it is a, far. It takes a while and, to get there. And the judge that's sitting there, I don't think she's the only one. There's a couple there. But one of them is Joanna Siebert, Sabert, and she is a, a Clinton appointee. Very good judge there. She's presiding over this 13-count indictment for fraud, money laundering, theft of public funds, false statements, dishonesty, unemployment fraud, and everything else, lying to Congress. It's being led by the Eastern District of New York and Maine Justice at Department of Justice out of Washington, the Criminal Division, the Public Integrity Section. And um, this was the appearance, uh, not his appearance after arraignment, but this was a check-in sort of status conference, and the government revealed they have 80,000 pieces of paper that they want to turn over as part of their discovery obligations, their Brady material obligation um, to this defendant. And um, they, he seemed to be kind of nonplussed by it all. I would have been shocked by that number given the amount. Talk to talk to our audience from the federal, from a sorry, from the prosecutor's standpoint, what that volume means, put it in context, to me, and I've been involved with this, you know, I thought the number was quite high, given given the the count here. But from your perspective, it may not be. Give give our audience a perspective of, you know, how many, what goes into a criminal investigation, and why there would be such a volume of material avail, av available at the outset that is turned over to the defense. Yeah. So when you're doing a an investigate a criminal investigation, you you don't necessarily know what is going to lead to charges and what's going to show criminal activity. So you cast a wide net, and you start, especially with someone like George Santos. You know the fact that this was only a 13 count indictment was surprising to some people because his entire life, his entire existence, everything he does is a lie and a fraud and potentially criminal. And so I am sure when uh, the Department of Justice, the Eastern District, uh, United States United States Attorney's Office was doing an investigation into George Santos, they were looking, there's so much you could look for, right? There's so much you could investigate, you know, every single thing on his resume, every speech he gave that talked about, you know, things like my grandmother's a, you know, a Holocaust survivor, a Jew, or, you know, the fact that he, one of the charges was that he stole money, um, unemployment benefits from people who should actually get unemployment benefits by lying about whether or not he held a certain job. So how do you how do you investigate that crime? Well, first you have to investigate, did he actually have a job or not? How do you do that? You, whatever he said his job, what, you know, whatever he, you know his job was, you get his employment records, you get his bank uh, records to see what he deposits and his paycheck and how he gets it. And, you know, there's just, there's so many documents and paperwork that you need to get for every single thing. And you get emails, you you look in their phone and, you know, look, every email could be a page, right? It's a page of, of, um, of, you know, discovery material. And, and so you have to turn that all over. And, and in this day and age, 80,000 documents, it's, it is a lot, but it's not crazy numbers. I mean, we have 
you know, there, there are cases with millions of documents or terabytes worth of, of um, discovery that needs to be gone through. And there are ways that defense attorneys go through it and prosecutors go through it. You know, there's, there's what you do is you, you put it into a, um, a disc, like a, different a discovery platform is what they call them you know it's a way to to ingest the information and and put it in a way that's organized and and you can do word searches or you can many times uh what the government will do is they will point to the things that are going to be related to the charges directly but uh, but defense attorneys want more, right? They're going to be like, these are the documents you think are related to it, but I'm going to talk about all the other documents that show I'm innocent, right? So they, there's a lot that ha- they have to go through. It's not just the things that are directly related to the charges in a particular indictment. When you're a defense attorney doing, your, if you're a good one doing your job, you're going to look at as much of that as you possibly can because you're building your own case to show why you're innocent, right? Or if you can't do that because you, you build you, you do what you can to poke holes in the government's case, right? If you if you can't um, legitimately assert that you are innocent or that it didn't happen or whatever, you then look at ways, you look at the weaknesses in the government's case. And you, again, do that through all the other materials. So so it's not really, the, the law doesn't allow the government to make a decision about what's relevant or not. That's really up to the defense attorney to decide what's relevant. It's really anything related to a particular case, a particular charge, um, you know, in a particular defendant, as well as what you said, Brady, which is specific things that tend to show that tend to exculpate you or show that you might be innocent. Um, those are those things as well have to be turned over as part of discovery. So, you know, like 80,000, it is a lot, but it's not a crazy amount. And I think the reason um, they asked for not that much time to go through it, actually, they asked until September to set a motion schedule uh, because they really, they, they're acknowledging that this isn't, you know, they don't need like a year to go through this discovery, right? And so at, in September, they're then going to talk about, you know, motion, and, you know, schedule uh, and deadlines, trial date, et cetera. You know, but the, the one thing I do want to... Um, point out is, uh, well, two things. Number one, um, I noticed when I was doing research for this, right, for this, for our podcast, I was kind of reading stuff on this. And I saw that Santos is out there defending Trump and going after DeSantis pretty hard, you know, and he's squarely putting himself in the Trump camp. And what struck me there is he knows he's going to get convicted. And I think that's, he's, he's angling for a pardon. He's hoping that in his mind, you know, he's, um, Trump's going to win, or at least has the best chance of winning the Republican nomination and maybe the, um, and maybe the presidency. So I want to, I want to angle for a pardon. So he's, he's leaning hard in that. And that's part of his defense, if you will, because how do you defend an entire life, an entire lie that's, you know, your, his whole life is a complete lie. The other thing that, that I wanted to just point out about this particular indictment that, that struck me is, is, you know, again, this is only 13 counts. This could be George Santos could be, you know, a 200 count indictment or a 500 count. I mean, the number of lies and, but not just lies, criminal lies. Okay. The fraud that he perpetrated against voters, against the American public to get to Congress, the money he has stolen from individuals and then take saying it's going to be for uh, my election, but then putting it in his bank account, you know, to buy clothes or, or pay his rent or whatever it is he does. This guy, you could have, this, this could be the greatest criminal conspirator of all time. And, but what the Eastern District prosecutors decided to do was to, it was more important to bring s- charges against him that were streamlined, swift, certain soon because you know he's a member of congress he is in the house he does a lot of damage and you know con- members of congress they're up for election every two years so he's up for election again in 2024 and so they had to do this quickly the voters need to know one way or another quickly so they just picked 13 counts of what could be many to bring against him and i bring this up because i think that's what's going to happen with jack smith you know i was listening to um to you and Ben's Saturday, uh, Saturday Legal AF. And, you know, 
you guys are so right that the sweeping nature of the charges that could be brought against Donald Trump regarding January 6th. I mean, it is this, you could, you could investigate this case and never stop because again, he is a one man crime spree, Donald Trump. And I get, I'm just more and more feeling and sensing that Jack Smith is going to bring a streamlined kind of like this George Santos 13 count, a streamlined Jan six case against Donald Trump and others like Mark Meadows, like Rudy Giuliani. And I think it's going to be, you know, very narrow. I don't think it's going to be absolutely everything that can be brought. And I'll tell you why. Number one, I think, you know, he needs to get this case brought and he needs to get it brought before the general election. And, and the, the more, the more limited the case, I think the better the chance of getting that done. If it's too complicated, he will push this out until, you know, forever. Number one. Number two, again, you could investigate it to death, right? It is absolutely a one man walking criminal enterprise and it, spans, you know, it spans multiple states, you know, it spans, you know, the January 6th and the insurrection. It has to do with, you know, Mike Pence and his efforts, you know, to get him to, to um, not certify the election. I mean, I, I think, I think it could be, and it could be even, even broader than that, but I do think it's going to be a more streamlined the way the George Santos one is to get the case brought to get it to get it going uh, before the election, and again, that's going to have massive discovery, right? Massive. I also think Jack Smith is going to want to go first before Fonnie Willis because if he doesn't, uh, if Fonnie Willis goes first, there's something called the Pettit policy or Petite policy. I don't never know how to pronounce it in the Department of Justice, which basically says if the state's already brought something, even though they can bring it, they typically don't. And he knows Fonnie Willis is bringing this case in July slash August. So he's very aware of that. And he is not going to want to run into the Department of Justice's own Pettit policy. So I, I don't know. I just like, that's partly why I woke up this morning thinking this is coming soon. Like I think this week or next week, and again, this is just my own spidey sense, tingly feeling whatever you know it is that 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 we have but I think it's I think that's what's going to happen and and the George Santos this particular case and rereading it and seeing how they did it I thought is exactly what Jack Smith is going to do it's going to be um, limited and streamlined to um, a discrete like I think those three discrete categories actually I think it's going to be you know the the attempt to steal the election through the states the attempt to steal the election through Pence and uh, Jan six insurrection I think that's you know it's going to be boom boom boom. Well, let's talk about Pence and then we'll kind of wrap it up at the end with uh, the overarching Mar-a-Lago and where the other indictments go. So we've got reporting. I mean we knew it in, we knew it in 2020. We knew it because there was a funny, uh, funny moment in, in uh, justice when uh, then Governor Ducey of Arizona, who's a close personal friend of Mike Pence, who had told reporters that on his cell phone, his ringtone for both Mike Pence and Donald Trump was hail to the chief. Whenever the president enters the room, at least that's what they play. And um, that was his ringtone. Well, at the moment that uh, Ducey, Doug Ducey, was uh, signing the real electoral certificate in favor of Joe Biden, awarding him the 11 electoral votes for Arizona because he had won the state by more than 10,000 voters. It wasn't by a little. It was by, you know, a nice size. While the signing ceremony was going on at television, a the ringtone can be heard at about the seven second mark in the video with the uh uh yeah let's play it salty if we have it because it's funny uh we'll just get to the part where the where he turns off the phone Ducey, and continues to sign the, <laughs> the certificate and then we'll talk about mike pence not being in trouble because of this right there <laughs> 
And there's the certificates. I love that. It's such, I mean, you would have thought this was a Saturday Night Live skit, but it was real. And so we knew at the time, because it was reported that day by the local newspapers in Arizona and otherwise, that Ducey got a phone call from the president or the vice president and refused to take it, continued to sign the certificate. He went on that day to confirm that Arizona's election process was safe and secure and that the he could trust the votes and all the things that you say when you're about to leave office uh, and you're not running for anything. You tell the truth. And that's what he did. So we always knew about that. But what we didn't really know is uh, there was a recording of prior phone calls before that exact one where Donald Trump got caught calling Ducey trying to urge him like he did in Georgia with the phone call to Brad Raffensperger and others to have them find the 11,758 votes. He was doing the exact darn thing with Doug Ducey trying to find 10,000 votes and pressuring him there. And when that didn't work, knowing that Ducey and Pence had a relationship going back to when du Pence was the governor of Indiana and Ducey was the secretary of state for the state, or, or he was the treasurer, I forget which one, and was running for governor. Each one supported each other. When Trump picked Pence, Ducey had a big statement of support and Pence supported Ducey when he ran for governor. So they're, they're like buddies. So uh, Pence, I don't know in what capacity, he's, he's trying to argue it was while he was the, the president of the Senate counting the votes. He was making phone calls, not just to this governor, but to other, other governors and secretary of states. And then in an interview with CBS News this past weekend, Pence tries to walk it all back and says two extraordinary things. Hopefully we can have that clip. One is he says, Things were all just normal at the White House in November and December as, as the lead up to Jan 6. We know for a fact, Mike, talking to you, based on Jan 6 committee testimony, that it was helter skelter and all hell was breaking loose because Donald Trump was using the Department of Justice and private lawyers around him to cling to power and to do whatever he could, whether it was weaponize the Department of Justice and have them send interfering letters to secretaries of state to investigate fraud that didn't exist or file 70 lawsuits that were being led by Giuliani, Je Jenna Ellis, and Sidney Powell. Like, what are you effing talking about? Well, maybe that's normal for the White House, for Trump's White House. Maybe it was well, normal to be criminal, crazy, it was, it under skelter. <laughs> But in the same breath, he says, yeah, there were 60 lawsuits. It was really 70. There were 60 lawsuits going on, but everything was totally fine. And I was just checking in with governors. Let's play the clip. Reporting in the Washington Post that President Trump back in 2020 after the election repeatedly asked you to call the governor of the state of Arizona, Doug Ducey, to get him to substantiate President Trump's claims false claims of fraud. Uh, the Post is reporting you did call the Arizona governor multiple times to discuss the election. Uh, is that reporting accurate? And what did you tell Governor Ducey at the time? I did check in uh, with uh, not only Governor Ducey, but other governors in states that were going through the legal process of reviewing their election results. But uh, there was no pressure involved. Margaret, I was I was calling to get an update. I passed along that information uh, to the president, and uh, it was no more, no less than that. You are clearly saying you did not pressure the governor, but were you being pressured by Mr. Trump uh, to get those uh, to influence Doug Ducey? And did you talk about this with the special counsel? Uh, no, I, I, I don't remember any pressure. Look, the president and I, uh, things came to a head at the end. Uh, Margaret, I've spoken about very openly, and the president and I continue to have uh, a strong difference. Uh, I'll always believe that by God's grace, I, I did my duty under the Constitution uh, that day in presiding over a joint session of Congress uh, in, in the aftermath of the mayhem and the rioting. Uh, but in, in the days of November and December, this was, a, this was an orderly process. You'll remember there were more than 60 lawsuits underway. States were engaging in appropriate reviews and that uh, these contacts were no more than that. Well, there. So two extraordinary things, right? Mike Pence is not tethered to reality. And yet he's, he's, he's trying to position himself as not only the alternative to Donald Trump, but a hero, hero on Jan 6, because he did his duty constitutionally 
and and accepted the real electors, not the phony electors. Good for you, man. That's a lot of balls to to not uh, not be a direct participant in the coup and accept the real electoral certificates, which you were supposed to do. And and he said, well, you know, I might disagree with Trump on a lot of things, but I did my duty on that day. No, you didn't, Mike. If you were making phone calls to pressure them and use your powers of friendship to try to find ways to overturn the will of the people. That's not courage. That's not a profile in courage. That's cowardice and uh, treason. And we're, what we're trying to figure out, both based on the test, his own testimony, his compelled testimony to the grand jury, we're, we're trying to figure out how up to his neck uh, Mike Pence is in the coup. Because I always thought he didn't do much. He wasn't on the phone calls to Georgia. At least we had thought that. He didn't make the other phone calls to the battleground states. But now we've learned that he did. So he was being used as a tool, the tool that he is, by Donald Trump in order to make these phone calls to cling to power. So, um, Karen, you've heard the clips. Mike Pence, we know about Donald Trump's and the recordings of Donald Trump. We, we know we know that only he thought these were perfectly fine phone calls because nothing says that to, uh, that the other person doesn't think it's totally fine, like hitting record every time they're on the phone call with Donald Trump. Uh, give us your perspective about how, where do you think, let's focus on Mike Pence. Where do you think Mike Pence is in all of this? Look, I mean, Mike Pence, I still, you know, in the world of, of culpability and, you know, who's the most culpable. I still have to give Mike Pence, he, he still certified the election ultimately, right? He didn't succumb to the pressure, not saying he's not also culpable, but he's not Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump is, you know, the all time criminal, right? And Pence is, you know, whatever, he's, he's a lesser, <laughs> a lesser one. Um, but, you know, what was sort of interesting here to me was uh, was that Ducey said publicly that he was surprised that Jackson hadn't reached out to him, you know, that his team hadn't reached out to him. So, you know, why is that, right? Because, you know, I guess apparently what was reported was that um, was uh, Ducey was talking to a donor and talking about how, you know, that in this donor on under the condition of anonymity said that, um, you know, that that Trump's efforts to cajole, you know, Ducey through Pence, you know, was was this pressure here, right? That that he felt pressure that Trump was getting Pence to to call and 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 tell him to find, you know, ten thousand votes or whatever it was. Um, you know, look, I think this is gonna be ultimately potentially uh I think I think Jack Smith could charge conspiracy. And remember how we talked about speaking indictments and um, how they have lots of, uh, they tell a story of what happened. I think in the conspiracy to overthrow or to, to, um, to basically steal the election, I think in that conspiracy, uh, I think part of that is going to be this trying to get the states to, um, you know, trying, trying to get the states to not certify, uh, you know, to get false slate of electors. I think that this will be this, these phone calls of Pence to Ducey and Trump to Ducey will be overt acts in the conspiracy. I think they will be listed that on such, you know, especially if there are recordings that on such and such a date, a phone call was, was placed where there was pressure to find more votes or pressure to put in a false slate of electors or, uh, you know, in, in Georgia to find 11,780 votes. Or, you know, I think those are all going to be listed as overt acts in the conspiracy. So I think this is really part of the story. Uh, that comes in and, and look, Ducey's no longer in office, you know, reading between the lines there is he just, they, you know, Trump turned on Ducey, called him a rhino uh, and, you know, a coward and all the things that Trump does. And, you know, he just was like, that's it. I'm done. I don't want to have anything to do with these, you know, these crazy people anymore as normal, as usual, the way Trump does, you know, with his, with his um, bullying of everybody. So, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see where, where this goes, but I would suspect that you're going, this is going to appear potentially in both 
Fonnie Willis's uh, RICO indictment that we know is coming, as well as in Jack Smith's January 6th indictment as overt acts in the conspiracy. That's my yeah. that's my prediction. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think Jack Smith is racing to get his indictment out the door um, related to Jan 6 and the interference grand jury before Fonnie Willis has already announced as the marker the end of July, beginning of August is when her grand jury next meets, where she's c- literally cleared the streets of downtown Atlanta uh, by <laughs> by order and request, um, so that uh, she can control the um, you know any kind of public outburst or Jan Six event from happening down there. But I think you're right. I think um, he'll 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 race to do that, and we'll talk about more superseding indictments, the amended indictments, new indictments that we think are coming down, even related to Mar-a-Lago, the cooperating witnesses that Jack Smith has, uh, the uh, big uh, um, problems of Walt Nauta that continue to multiply, the former petty officer for the U.S. Navy, who's been the valet and body man for Donald Trump, both in the White House all the way to Mar-a-Lago, and is continuing to uh, be a, a conjoined twin with Donald Trump um, it, because he's a co def He's the one of only two co-defendants right now. There's only two of them right now, more to come, I'm sure, in the Mar-a-Lago criminal investigation. And we'll update you all about what's happening down in Mar-a-Lago because there are some interesting new events that we'll be able to interpret for you. But first, a final word from our sponsor. Oh, you're going to love this one. Green Chef has expanded their menu. Now choose from over 50 weekly menu and market items with the option to mix and match meals in the same box without changing your plan. Get everything you need at Green Market, your one-stop shop for quick breakfasts, brunch kits, wholesome lunches, and more you can easily add onto your weekly order. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well with meals that work for you, not the other way around. Celebrate summer with seasonal recipes featuring certified organic fruits and vegetables, organic cage-free eggs, and sustainably sourced seafood. Green Chef is the only meal kit that has both carbon and plastic offset. Green Chef offsets 100% of their delivery admissions to your door, as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. Plus, nearly all packaging materials are curbside recyclable in most areas in the U.S. Bring more flavor to your table this summer with Green Chef's delicious, nutritionist-approved recipes featuring certified organic fruits and vegetables and unique farm-fresh ingredients like tart cherries, truffle zest, and rainbow carrots. My absolute favorite, spicy chicken and broccoli stir fry. Delicious. Go to greenchef.com slash legalaf60 and use code legalaf60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash legalaf60 and use code legalaf60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Our next partner is AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I drink it literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I was tired of taking so many supplements, and I wanted a single solution that supports my entire body and covers my nutritional basis every day. I wanted better gut health, a boost in energy, immune system support, and wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. I drink AG in the morning to start my day. It makes me feel unstoppable and ready to take on anything. And on top of it all, I'm doing something good for my body. I'm giving my body the nutrition it craves, and I'm covering my nutritional basis. I've tried a ton of different supplements out there, but this is different. And the ingredients are super high quality. I got started with AG1 because I used to take all these different pills and gummies, who knows what, and frankly, what I was taking was expensive, and I didn't even know if it was good for me. But with AG1, I know what I'm consuming has the best ingredients and also tastes delicious. AG1 makes it easier for you to take the highest quality supplements, period. When I started my AG1 journey, very quickly, I noticed that it helps me with improved digestion, energy, and overall, I just feel great. It's just one scoop of powder mixed with water, once a day, making it a seamless and easy daily habit to maintain. 
I'm asked all the time about the one thing I'd do to take care of my health if I could only pick one. It'd be foundational nutrition, and AG1 is a top foundational nutrition product. Just one daily serving gives me the comprehensive foundational nutrition I need and supports energy, focus, strength, and clarity with 75 high-quality vitamins, probiotics, and whole food sourced ingredients. I can't think of another daily routine that pays off as well as AG1, which is why I trust the product so much. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash legal AF. That's drinkag1.com slash legal AF. Check it out. Well, we've teased it long enough. It's time to talk about Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump, Walt Nauta, cheesesteaks in Philly, uh, <laughs> I love that one for those that watch on YouTube. There is literally a photo taken from the other side of Pat's cheesesteaks of Walt Nauta and Donald Trump ordering cheesesteak and having their own little bromance date right after the Moms for Liberty right wing radical conference that everybody has to go on the right right wing side has to go genuflect and and kiss the tuchus of that's a legal term um in order for them to become the republican nominee so everybody trotted out to this group that wasn't around except for covid of of um an astroturf group that got formed in order to attack all of joe biden's policies and everything else and then of course they stopped for a bite at um at one of I, I know there's millions of other places that serve Philly cheesesteaks, and I got I, I did a hot take on it, and I got a whole bunch of there's 30 other places other than Pats and Geno's. I'm like that may be true, but I'm from the Jersey Shore, and I only know two, and the, those are the two that I that I know. But let let's first let's update first, right? We've got Walt Nauta, who's had like six weeks to get a lawyer who is admitted in the federal court, Southern District of Florida, to stand next to his other lawyer being paid by the Save America PAC by Donald Trump, Stan Woodward, because you need local counsel. Which is sort of weird. I had somebody actually challenge me in my hot take, says, you don't need a law any lawyer. I'm like, okay, this is why people watch Legal AF. You got to be a member of the bar that you're practicing in front of, in this case, the federal bar and a specific federal bar. You either have to take the test like I did and become a member of the Southern District of Florida, Southern District of New York, Eastern District of this, Second Circuit, U.S. Supreme Court. Your, your regular bar license to practice in a state like I'm admitted in Florida and New York it doesn't get you the ticket into the courthouse to be a member of the bar, literally a member of the bar that allow people think, what's the bar? The bar is that historic traditional piece of wood in the courtroom. And those that are a member of the bar can be in front of it closest to the judge. And those who aren't a member of the bar have to stand behind the bar. That's where that bar, that bar comes from the well of the courtroom and the bar that being there. So he can't find, for whatever reason, a, a Southern District Florida lawyer, there's so many of them, to come forward. He's already had his arraignment postponed twice. The day that Trump was arraigned, Walt Nauta didn't have a local Southern District Florida lawyer. He only had Stan Woodward, who was not admitted. And judges are really particular about who gets to speak in court. And you don't get to speak in court unless you're a member of the court's bar. So Stan Woodward just sat there like uh, like a dummy, couldn't say a word. And the, the magistrate judge said, you know what? Well, come back. Come back on the, I think it was the 27th of, of June and, and bring bring the right lawyer with you at that time. So they had a lot of time, three weeks. 27th of June rolls around and Walt now has another problem. Despite the fact that I thought he traveled on Air Trump, you know, which is supposed to be better than Air Force One. Somehow he, he he got grounded and he couldn't and his and his plane got delayed or canceled because of storms and he missed that one. Now he's got one more shot. And it's tomorrow to show up with a local Southern District Florida lawyer. If he doesn't, everyone's like, "This is a delay." He's just delaying, and in a way, I understand the position because Judge Cannon, right on cue issued, we can put it up again, issued an order on the 30th that said, in light of the delay in Walt Nauda's arraignment, I'm going to extend the time for the defense, Nauda and Trump, to respond to Jack Smith's motion to continue the trial until December. Remember, the judge had set an August date and the and Jack Smith said, 
That's fast, Judge, and we like fast, but December is probably more like it given the national security documents and other security clearances that have to be arranged. So let's do December, which is also incredibly fast for a case like this. And so they, the judge wants the defense to comment on that, and we know what the comment's going to be. That's too fast. Um, you know, this we this needs to be after he's in office again, and maybe he gets elected president. Um, and so there's going to be this tug of war in the court and at the hearing. The judge wants full briefing, meaning both sides get to argue. And so she she's now extended the time for the defense, including now, to, until the 10th of July, which again, it's right around the corner, to file their papers. There's been no lawyer that's appeared. He can now, that lawyer can appear tomorrow on the record for the arraignment of Walt Nauta. But if he's not there, then, and Karen, you and I were speculating about this, I think he, they just reach into the pool of federal public defenders whose offices are right there and they go, hey, you, public defender, come in here. Stand next to Mr. Woodward. You're now Mr. Nowd as a lawyer for the arraignment and for the responding to Judge Cannon's uh, July 10th deadline to file the brief. Uh, they're not going to delay it again or they're going to put him in the federal detention center. Like I let you out a month ago I don't know which magistrate's going to be. We're going to find out who the duty. We can probably look up online who the duty magistrate is going to be for uh, Thursdays in uh, in Miami, and and whoever that is, maybe when 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 you're when you're giving your commentary, Karen, I'll look it up. But it's that magistrate, and they're going to go. No, I'm sorry. Why don't you hope you brought a toothbrush because you're going to the federal detention center across the street, and we'll hold you there until you get a lawyer because we've given you enough opportunities. Uh, that's that. I agree with you. And then I'll turn it back to you, Karen, that the superseding indictment, Rudy Giuliani's getting indicted. He gave a proffer. Nobody thinks it was good enough. The reporting is they were like, okay, great. We'll give you the queen for the day. We'll give you the immunity for the day. But he, he I think he gets indicted. John Eastman certainly gets indicted in, the, in, a, in an indictment. Meadows is given a proffer. Christina Bob is given a proffer about Mar-a-Lago. Evan Corcoran is given a testimony against Donald Trump in Mar-a-Lago. So I think you see the new Mar-a-Lago, which is going to have more counts and more evidence in it. And then you've got these other ones that are going to come out um, as new indictments in these other places, maybe in Florida, maybe in New Jersey, maybe in Washington, D.C. All the indictments don't have to be in the same place. They have to be cited and put where it is appropriate, given the crimes that were committed and all of that. So why don't you take that forward and give your sort of former prosecutor point of view on all of that. Yeah, so I think Jack, if I, if putting Jack's, my Jack Smith hat on, I think what I'd be thinking of right now is, do I supersede this indictment at all? Because, you know, on the one hand, uh, if there are some crushing charges that I wanna bring, like rock solid, no matter who the juror is, charges that I wanna bring, I would supersede. It's very easy to supersede federally because you can just read in the prior indictment or you bring an FBI agent in to summarize the the prior uh, testimony. You don't, you don't necessarily, hearsay is allowed in a federal grand jury, and then you add the other charges to it. I would be careful, though, if I was Jack Smith, to add any charges to this indictment, because that just, again, gives Trump an opportunity to say, oh, now there's new charges. I need more time. Let's delay. This is different. You know, I thought I could have done the other case sooner because it was only, you know, a certain number of charges. But if, if you know, you added these other charges or you'll, ha or if you add other defendants, right, you'll have too many lawyers who have conflicts or too many lawyers who also want an opportunity to uh, be able to uh, make motions or who need security clearances, et cetera. So I don't know whether it makes sense for Jack Smith to supersede the indictment and bring more defendants or more charges, especially because you've got Judge Eileen Cannon, who I think is a terrible draw for a judge for uh for the Department of Justice. So if I were Jack Smith, I mean, like it's possible because, you know, you also can't really forum shop or jurisdiction shop or venue shop uh, as a government. You have to, where the crime happened, you kind of have to bring the charges there. And since Mar-a-Lago's in Florida, I think it made sense that he brought the case there. But I, if I were him, I would probably say, okay, I've got a pretty solid case. It's a streamlined case. It looks like I have a, a, a court date that I can, you know, that, that will happen. I want a trial before the election. I might actually just leave it 
Um, or, or if I'm superseding it, make it very limited so that he can't make the arguments to, um, to delay things significantly. Um, but I would be doing is bringing other charges in other jurisdictions. So, you know, I think there are some charges that could be brought in uh, New Jersey, for example, right? Because of the Bedmin, you know, we know all about Bedminster now. And if the witnesses can sufficiently talk about the documents, or maybe those documents exist, or, you know, that we can prove, you know, that, that he possessed, um, you know, national defense information and was, was showing it, maybe that he was disseminating it, distributing it. You know, there's, there's other charges that could be brought in New Jersey. I think if I were Jack Smith, I'd be looking to do that. So to hopefully get a better judge that's more even, more fair. Um, Eileen Cannon is, is, you know, not necessarily that. Um, so I, I would try to do that. And I think there's some potential DC charges as well, especially related to the election, Jan 6, the insurrection, et cetera. So, so that's what I think is, is happening. I do agree with you that Walt Nata, you know, any other judge, we'll see what Eileen Cannon does, but any other federal judge would never allow him to just postpone his arraignment for a third time as, as, as we discussed earlier before, uh, before the podcast, Should, they would either, um, they'd either appoint a federal defender, which is what I think they will do if he doesn't have a lawyer, or they'll put him in because uh, any federal judge would see that this is, you know, everyone knows that Donald Trump has to be the one to uh, approve of Walt Nauda's attorney, right? He's he's hiring them. And, and if I'm Trump, I don't want to hire an attorney because that will just, straight, you know, make the process go forward because I want delay. It's all about delay for him. So, you know, maybe, maybe, of course, there are lawyers who'd be willing to represent Walt Nata, but are they ones that Donald, that are acceptable to Donald Trump? We know he's paying for it, right? So, you know, it's, to me, it's a delay tactic by Donald Trump through Nata, Nauda. Um, but we'll see if, if Eileen Cannon sees that. We'll see if she holds him to account, but he absolutely needs to be arraigned. This process has to go forward. And we'll see what happens. Well, it should be a magistrate. It shouldn't be canon. Should, the magistrates have been doing all the arraignment. I just looked it up. The one for today, the duty judge for today, is literally just to remind everybody, in federal court, um, there is a magistrate that's assigned to the case. In this case, it's Judge Reinhardt. He's the one that's also de has is deciding, and we'll, we'll just round it out here. Judge Reinhardt is the permanent magistrate that handles many, many things in lieu of the judge the Article Three trial judge, in this case, Judge Cannon. Magistrate judges handle discovery issues, search warrant issues, sometimes motions to suppress evidence. It just depends on what the judge has, has, has um, given them, um, has allocated to them. And in the case of Judge Reinhardt, he's told the Department of Justice that he's inclined to unseal, meaning take the redaction tape, the black tape off of the uh, more of the affidavits that were used, including of confidential informants and other witnesses, to support him, Reinhardt, having issued the search warrant, because he's the search warrant judge, back in August of last year that started this whole thing off at Mar-a-Lago. And we've already seen about three or four months after that, a redacted version with a heavy black tape, you know, you know, about everywhere where you just want, you know, you're, you know, you're ready to grab the popcorn. Uh, and then Donald Trump gave the instruction to eh, uh, to do eh. you're like, crap, that's the part I wanted. And so the judges like the magistrate judges have to balance because there's three parties in our justice system, especially when it comes to the criminal justice system that are important and have a seat at the table. One is the prosecution. In this case, the United, they get to announce themselves as the United States of America. Um, Karen announced herself as the people of the state of New York. Uh, they get to do that. Second is the defense. And the third is the public. Uh, that's what one of the things that distinguishes our system of, of justice from some other systems of justice, especially in totalitarian regimes, is that we do everything in the public. We seal very little. It may be initially sealed, but ultimately it'll be unsealed. We close very few doors. We may not televise it. We may not, but transcripts will come out. People will be allowed up to capacity to be in the courtroom. We don't do private secret trials, right? We don't do star chambers. And so there's this balance that the judges have to have. to have. And then the media helps also because they have a seat at the table on behalf of the public. They want everything public. 
You know, they, they don't care who's who's jeopardized by the in the in the investigation by having the names leaked out. And now, you know, the judge is looking at the Department of Justice and saying, you're nine months, 10 months from when you first filed. You understand that the public has a seat at this table and is entitled to know what your evidence was. Um, so it, unless you've got a national security reason 10 months later, and or a reason, and I've already, you know, there's already orders issued about Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump's conditions for arraignment release, in ter- including special conditions of not contacting what looks to be 84 witnesses. And we're still waiting to see what the Department of Justice does with their, um, either they're going to file a renewed motion um, to have the court accept under seal, also confidential, pri- uh, public, uh, private for a while, their 84 list of witnesses, or they're going to take Eileen Cannon's direction at its word. And she started it two weeks ago with, why are you even filing that? Just send that to the other side. If you got an issue, bring it back to me and say number 16 was violated. And then we can talk about in camera at that time. We haven't heard from, we haven't heard from the Department of Justice. They haven't refiled. My guess is that that they just sent it to the other side and says, here's the list of 84. If you got a problem, we can bring it to the judge then. But that is that balancing act. So I think um, Reinhardt has given the Department of Justice additional time to comment about or appeal whether they're going to be okay with ripping off the black tape and releasing a lot more information to the public that will get into the public domain, and we'll be talking about it here on Legal AF, about the basis and the confidential informants and the witnesses and the audio tapes and the evidence um, that's out there. And so we have that. Then you have, that's the Magistrate Reinhardt. Then for arraignment, you have whoever's on duty that day. Some people might think, wow, in a justice system like the United States, it's just who's assigned that day? Yes. Judge Magistrate Goodman arraigned Donald Trump because it was Tuesday and it was Judge Goodman's day for any who we got here for arraignments. Oh, former president of the United States. Bring him up. And that's how it went. I mean, he knew the day before that he was going to be the judge, but the magistrate judge. Now, tomorrow, I don't know because it's not yet up on the docket who the duty judge is on Thursdays in Miami, but that's who's going to be doing the arraignment. Now, they have the full file in front of them, and they have the docket in front of them, the electronic docket of entries, so they know what's transpired. They know the guy missed the boat, missed the plane last week. He, he what? And the reason what we're talking about, because sometimes we talk in such crypt, sometimes in shorthand, because we do so many hot takes and then, you know, we have two shows a week. I We have to remember some people are new to the show and aren't following it, of course, as closely as we are. So we're doing our job here. The, the arraignment is the official process by which someone once arrested as part of the indictment is released under conditions back into general population, back into the public. Walt Nauda didn't go through that process. He was arrested, but he wasn't arraigned. He's in a weird twilight where they let him out subject to a future arraignment where conditions for his release will be set. Sounds like it's ass backwards, and it it is a little bit. And and some people might, might be saying, is that really unusual? Aren't they getting special treatment? And the answer to that is yes, to both. A normal, everyday garden variety criminal, or one, I like the phrase you used today, Karen, one who's just a one-man crime spree, would not be able to get this. They'd be sent to the federal detention center, the FDC, in downtown Miami or the one in West Palm Beach or the one in Fort Lauderdale to go sit in the clink and, and see their lawyers only, you know, um, in the in the uh, in the kitchen area with vending machines, I've been there for clients, uh, uh, and discuss their case. Uh, wearing, you know, uh, I think in Florida it's a it's not orange uh, in federal. I think it's tan. Wearing a tan jumpsuit. So that didn't happen for Walt Nauda. He's been given quite a lot of slack. But I agree with you. He doesn't show up tomorrow. Tries to delay things one more time. Whoever that duty judge is tomorrow, magistrate judge is going to say. You got a choice. You can go spend the night or beyond the federal detention center, or you can go pick a federal public defender, but you're getting a rain today. And I want to hear from the government about special conditions and conditions of release for Mr. Nauda. Now with Trump, just to bring it full circle with my cheesesteak, because I did a sub-reference to cheesesteaks, and people are probably thinking, Popak's either really hungry 
<laughs> because what is the link between Trump now and the cheese steaks and this podcast? I'm going to do it right here. If you give me long enough on this podcast with Karen, I will tie it up. Here we go. When Judge Goodman did a special condition when he when he arraigned Trump, not Nauta, he said, well, the government hasn't asked for this, but I'm going to impose a limitation. Trump is not to talk about the case to anyone on a list that the government is going to prepare of witnesses or potential witnesses in the case. And that includes, of course, number one, co-defendant Walt Nauta. Now, the magistrate judge recognized, and Todd Blanche, the lawyer for Donald Trump, um, and the lawyers for Donald Trump were like all over Walt Nauta in that arraignment of Donald Trump. You could just talk about a pressure campaign. I mean, the lawyer for Donald Trump was like, uh, for Walt Nauta was like sidelined. And it was just like, it was like Chris Kice and Todd Blanche just on top of Nauta. I'm like, okay. Like, if you don't think he's had, he's got influence over the guy through the purse string because he's paying for his lawyer or because his lawyers are beating the guy up, and he is. And so, Goodman said, I get it. You're, you're, some of you are still working together, like your butler there, your valet, former petty officer, Nauda, and you. But don't talk about the case or that violates my order. So what do these two idiots do? Donald Trump gets Walt Nauda alone over a cheesesteak in Philly and goes sits by himself. Now, what do we think he's talking about? How great the speech was at the Moms for Liberty rally? Or are they actually also sliding into conversations about his testimony, his lawyer, who he's about to pick, and all the things that Goodman, as a special condition, said he couldn't talk about? That's up for the prosecutors to decide whether they're going to make a federal case out of it, make a big deal out of it, and bring it up and do a filing with the court and saying, hey, you know, we're okay with the guy working together, but do they have to have a date, a cheesesteak date? Um and so we, we got that going on and cameras are everywhere and cell phones are everywhere, including at the kitchen of Pat Lafreda's or Pat's uh, cheesesteaks in Philadelphia. So that's what's happened. That's what's going to happen. We'll report tomorrow. One of us will do a hot take. All of us will do a hot take on what happens with Walt Nauta tomorrow. And the next big date on the calendar, subject to the to Bart Jack Smith filing something about the 84 witness list being sealed or not, or he's maybe he's handled it a different way, will be July 10th when the defense, including we hope Nauta, gives the judge their position on whether the December trial date works. Newsflash, they're going to say it doesn't. And they want a much further kick the can as far away as possible. Time is their friend. It's not a friend to justice because justice delayed is justice denied. Karen, that's what I got on Nauda, cheesesteaks, Donald Trump, my tingly feeling, superseding indictments, future indictments. Last word for you on all things Donald Trump and Mar-a-Lago. So Salty just sent us uh, Donald Trump's latest fake tweet where it's just really sad and disgraceful. You know, he goes on and on about the there's cocaine at the White House, etc. Um, and it's Joe and Hunter Biden. And then he goes, but this last sentence is just really, it's upsetting. He says, has, de has deranged Jack Smith, the crazy Trump hating special prosecutor been seen in the area of cocaine? He looks like a crackhead to me. I mean, I, I just, you know, that's just offensive. And, um, I just can't believe this man is running for president that he was president. You know, he just resorts to name calling to, you know, false uh, accusations, you know, and, and now his followers are going to, are going to talk about a, an amazing person, Jack Smith, who's a respected lawyer and prosecutor and who really has, you know, is a public servant who is, is been a public servant his entire career. He's a good person. And, and, You've got a former president of the United States calling him a crackhead or saying he looks like a crackhead. It's just really, uh, just really upsetting. And um, to use a Ben word, it's it's really despicable, actually. So um, I just I just can't get over it. I can't I can't believe it um, that this is what he does. But anyway, my last final word is enjoy the Yankee game tonight. <laughs> uh, uh oh, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get flamed. I'm gonna know, get flamed in the chat. We're in New York, so what are yeah. they going to do? You can go to a Yankee game. So enjoy. Don't the worry, game. we'll we'll be in. We'll all be in live chat tonight. 
<laughs> well, we've reached the end of another midweek edition of Legal AF with your regular co-anchors, Karen Friedman, Agnifilo, and Michael Popak. Only, you guessed it, on the Midas Touch Network. It's the same place you can go if you subscribe for free on YouTube. You can get all of our content there. It's listed under Legal AF. And then Karen, me, Ben, we all do hot takes, trending takes um, about every day. You can get reminders set for you. And we're doing it just like this. We just do it solo. Sometimes we, we join together on something very interesting. You've done a couple with Ben. I've done it with Ben. I've done it with you. And the three of us have done them together on cutting edge, breaking news stories at that intersection of law and politics. Those politically charged litigation matters that, that, we, that we bring to you only on the Midas Touch Network on Legal AF. People ask, how can we help? How can we help support? We like the content. How do we, what do we do about it? Well, it's easy. Everything's free. Just subscribe free to the Midas Touch Network on the YouTube channel. When we drop the audio of this, because we're doing it now on YouTube, and the last, I don't know, six months, we've been either the first, second, or third most watch YouTube live, because there's other live shows, in the world. Last week, we were number one. We had 17,000 people watch us at one point, and uh, that's that's heartening. But that's that's not us. That's not on us. That's you. You're the change you've been waiting for. <laughs> not, not us. We're just content providers. Uh, but we can't do it without a really supportive audience, and this, that's one way to support us. Go listen to us on the audio. Download the audio. You don't have to download it. Just listen to us on the audio. Leave a comment. Leave a five-star review if you think that's worthwhile. That helps us with the algorithms. Give us a thumbs up on the on the um, YouTube version. And if, you, if you're just a YouTube person, go check us out on the pod because it helps and vice versa. Some people said, I've never, I never knew what you guys look like. Come on YouTube, take a look. That's what we look like at, at any given moment. So uh, that also helps. And then we've got, um, uh, we've got merchandise in our merchandise store, which I think Salty will put up a link for that. There it is, that long sleeve shirt, short sleeve shirt, coffee mugs, all with the Legal AF logo on it at store.midastouch.com. These are the ways that you can help us. And we just are so pleased to have the Midas Mighty and the Legal AFers join us week after week. We're two and a half years into doing this. We're over 250 combined episodes. That's not including hot takes and all of that. And uh, literally could not do it without you. We thank you from the bottom of our heart. Um, and we'll see you uh, next Wednesday with Karen Friedman, Ecnifilo, and this Saturday with Ben Micellis and me. Good night, everybody. Shout out to the Midas Mighty. <laughs>